She is an incredible physician and clinical translational researcher. She trained at George Washington. We will forgive her that. Uh, did her undergrad um, at Caltech on the other side of the country, then back this way for her um, training um, in internal medicine in uh, University of Illinois, and then at the NCI really uh, focused her efforts uh, in the world of uh, leukemia and hematologic malignancies. And she's been an incredibly important part uh, addition to our faculty uh, across the board, um, especially during the last few months when um, they have had to do double and triple duty. Um, so uh, we thank her very much for that. Uh, but we're delighted that she can spend some time with us during Grand Rounds today um, and really uh, featuring some of the new science in uh, her area of expertise. So, Katie, I'll shut up and the floor and the Internet is yours. Okay. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, thank you, everybody, for having me. I'm happy to um, share some information specifically about hematologic malignancies in relation to COVID-19. Uh, these are my disclosures. So here's the roadmap for today, which is first I'll just briefly go over the epidemiology of COVID-19 uh, infection in hematologic malignancy patients. I'll then go on to review the published studies that we have that are out there that also um, partially related to cancer patients as well. Interestingly, there's a ASH registry that's focused on the United States and patients in hematologically, hematologic malignancy patients um, and their complications, so then I'll cover that, followed by some novel therapies, think, trying to think outside the box and how we treat COVID-19 in general and future directions. Okay, so just a brief overview for, for everybody. In terms of hematologic malignancies, uh, I know this is a review for, for everybody, but just to put, I know it's also July, so to put us on the, um, because there's, there's some new faces as well. So when we're talking about hematologic malignancies, we're talking about leukemias, lymphomas, and myeloma. And in terms of leukemias, we, I put it into acute and chronic. And acute leukemias are the ones where uh, the symptoms come on over days to weeks, so these are the patients that we are often seeing in the emergency room or then being admitted, and that consists of AML or ALL, and then the chronic leukemias, uh, which these patients are typically seen in internal medicine clinic who uh, die with their, their leukemia as opposed to from their leukemia is what I like to tell the patients, but that consists of CML and CLL. And then myelodysplastic syndrome, which is also blood cancer, but not technically a leukemia, but 30% of these patients will transform to leukemia at some point. Um, then we have the lymphomas, which encompass non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which makes up about 70 different subtypes. The most common that you see in, in general medicine would be the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is the most common aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, which is the most common indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then there's Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, and then last, myeloma, which makes up smoldering multiple myeloma and, and multiple myeloma. Okay, so going to the epidemiology of, of what we know so far about COVID-19, just in general about in cancer patients. So, it, it mostly varies based on the location, and so uh, what we gather from the data in Wuhan is that the incidence is twice as high, with the incidence being about 0.8% in cancer patients compared to 0.4% in the general population. When we look at the incidence in Madrid, the, the incidence is higher at 4.2% compared to 0.36%. Uh, and then in terms of prevalence, I found different studies that lo were looking at the rates really between anywhere between less than 1% to over 8.5%. When we look at mortality, the all-cause mortality, when looking at different studies and compiling many thousands of patients, the relative risk was higher at 1.66%, and the all-cause odds ratio was 2.54. And then in looking at severity and complications, 
you can see that the relative risk is also higher at 2.48. Okay, so first, generally, I'll focus on cancer patients and then get more specifically into how hematologic cancer patients are different than general can other cancer patients. So this was a study that was done in Montefiore in the Bronx, and it looked at 218 cancer patients between March and April of this year, and the median age was 69, and in general, 75% of the patients were solid tumor patients, and about 25% of them were heme malignancies. When you look at the overall death rate, the overall percentage was just under 30%. And you can see in the circles here that the, the percentage of death in solid tumors was about 25%, and uh, the percentage in hematologic malignancies was higher at just under 40%. When looking at solid tumor malignancies, the, most, the highest death rate was seen in patients with lung cancer. And in hematologic malignancies, the highest death rate was in myeloid malignancies, so again, AML and MDS. There is speculation that this higher death rate in the myeloid malignancy patients is likely because these patients are more immunosuppressed and are exposed to more immunosuppressive therapies. The thought behind the lung cancer patients is that the respiratory symptoms we know in COVID and then patients already having lung cancer contributes to the higher death rate. Okay, so when we look at incidence and survival in cancer patients based on type of treatment, this was a study that looked at 105 cancer patients from Wuhan, China, um, and compared it to 536 non-cancer patients. And what, so two things I really wanted to point out here was that in general, so the different, so the blue bars represent patients with no cancer, and then all the other colored bars are different types of therapy in all the cancer patients. So first point being is that, as you can see, that no matter what type of therapy, that patients had worse outcomes in relation to death, uh, needing ICU stay, severe complications, and in invasive ventilation compared to those without cancer. But the second point being that more specifically, patients who were on target, who were on um, immunotherapy in brown or who, had re who were receiving surgery for their cancer had more significant um, rates of death and other complications compared to other types of therapy. And on the right, you can see that um, in terms of the timeline of these events, it's really within the first 10 days in terms of all types of therapy having kind of this exponential increase in their rates of complications, again, with surgery and immunotherapy being higher rates. Uh, and compared to patients without cancer, you just have, have a gradual increase in the severity of complications with the flattening of the curve. So in general, some of the other things they found from this Wuhan study in cancer and COVID-19 was that active disease considered less than one year uh, of, of um, of therapy and metastatic disease showed a trend for increased mortality. However, active chemotherapy and radiotherapy were not associated with increased case fatality. 34% uh, of the patients that died in the study uh, came from a nursing home, and 61% of the patients that died were exposed to a healthcare environment, which included the patients who had been in a nursing home, but also looked at the patients who had had a prior hospitalization for something unrelated to, um, to COVID prior to their COVID diagnosis. Okay, uh, and so now going back to the, the New York study, just I think it's interesting to look at different age groups in relation to COVID-19 and the severity of the cases, because as we've seen uh, on the news, that there have been pediatric patients that have had severe cases as well as, as well as older patients. So what happens in these in different age ranges amongst cancer patients? So what it did is it uh, this the study did it, it looked at all the cancer deaths in the in the New York hospital and compared it to um, a set of controls also within the same hospital. But then they took and looked at the death rates in all of um, across all of New York State. 
And so what you can see is that in general, in cancer patients, irrespective of age group, there is a higher death rate, which was, is what we would expect. However, this death rate was only um, statistically significant in the pediatric population. However, this number is a really small number, but then also in the age range 45 to 64 and patients over 75. And so now getting more specifically into the heme malignancy patients in terms of looking at uh, severity of complications and death rate, as we, as I've mentioned, the rates of cancer patients, the rates of death and complications in cancer patients compared to non-cancer patients is significantly higher. When we look at the specific type of cancer, you can see that the hematologic cancer in purple is higher compared to the other solid tumor types. Um, but after hematologic cancers, you see the highest rates among lung cancer, followed by GI cancers, and then followed by breast cancer. And then again, when we're looking at survival and the timeline, you can see here on the right that the hematologic malignancy patients in purple have uh, the highest number of events and also the shortest time to events with this exponential kind of sharp vertical curve followed again by lung cancer, GI cancer, and interestingly, um, breast cancer and patients without cancer seem to have similar rates of events, at least in, in this study. Okay, now diving a little bit further, specifically looking at the breakdown of the severe events in hematologic malignancy patients compared to others to compare to other blood cancers, so what I've highlighted in red here is that all heme malignancy patients saw in this study, the percent of death rate was 33%, which was higher compared to 12% of all cancers. The um, average time to death was about 19 days, uh, which was similar to other cancers. Uh, when looking at the, the number or the percent of patients who required an ICU admission, in hematologic malignancies, it was 45%, so almost so more than double compared to other cancers at 20%. The average time these patients went to the ICU was very short, so most of these went um, within three days of their admission compared to about seven for other cancers. The 66% of these patients had critical symptoms compared to 34 and the average time to these critical symptoms was also short at just under four days uh, compared to, to about seven and a half. And then also looking at percentage of patient, these patients needing mechanical ventilation was, was higher at, at 22%, so double compared to about 10%. And the time to needing this mechanical um, ventilation was, was nine days compared to about 15 days. So then this was the only study that I could find that looks specifically at just hematologic malignancy patients, and this was taken from two main centers in Wuhan. Interestingly, they said that all patients received CT scans regardless of symptoms um, at the, um, or at the onset. So um, all patients who were hospitalized, um, who, had, who came in with COVID-19 symptoms had a CT scan, or if they were admitted for another reason and developed symptoms, then develop, then receive the CT scan. And then if they had positive findings, the PCR was done for confirmation. And the reason for this was that PCR was not universally done or accessible at the time of their, uh, at the time um, that this data was collected, and so that was the reason. In the study, 128 patients with hematologic cancers were evaluated, and they compared it to 224 healthcare providers who had also been hospitalized with, with COVID-19. So, um, or hospitalized in general, I'm sorry. So the rate of COVID positivity was 10% in the, in the blood cancer patients, and it was 7.1% in the hospital staff. And the median interval from the end of the last cycle of anti-cancer therapy to the diagnosis of COVID was nine days with a range of seven to 19. 
and 25% of the patients who received who had a hematologic malignancy had more than four cycles of an anti-cancer therapy prior to their diagnosis of COVID-19. And so I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the radiologic findings that we see on CT scan uh, in patients with COVID-19. This is just demonstrating three of the patients in their study. So again, the patients who had who were COVID positive amongst the the blood cancer patients were was 10% or 13 patients. This picture is a representation of three of the patients who were diagnosed by screening lung CT. Um, and then the remaining 10, 10 patients um, were had a lung CT after developing symptoms and had positive findings. In the 7% of healthcare providers who were diagnosed with COVID-19, there were 16 of them, and one of them had um, characteristic findings on screening CT, and the rest, the remaining 15, had CT findings uh, after the development of symptoms. So just to summarize other data that they found in hematologic cancer patients and COVID-19 compared to hospital workers with COVID-19, there was a decreased hemoglobin, lymphocyte, and platelet count. There were higher levels of D-dimer, AST, LDH, CRP, procalcitonin, and ferritin in these patients. There were higher rates of co-infections and more complications and there was a higher death rate of 61% compared to 0%. And so now moving on to data that is actively being collected. So the American Society of, of Hematology is our largest research organization that sponsors our large meeting where 40,000 hematologists come every year. And they also support our main hematology journal called Blood, which is, I say, the equivalent of New England Journal in medicine, and so they started a registry database that captures data on individuals who test positive for COVID-19 and have a hematologic um, malignancy either previously or currently. And it's an international registry that any, any provider can enter de-identified data. And so as of June 30th, 243 cases had, had been entered, and as you can see, here on the map that 100, the majority of the cases are coming from the United States with 164. There's a higher male predominance um, in terms of race, racial background. The majority of the patients have been Caucasian. And if we look at the age breakdown, you can see most of the patients are between the age of 50 and 80. And so what do we see? So they asked about comorbidities of these patients. And in general, I would say that it seems to be similar to what we see in the general population with the most common medical issues being hypertension, diabetes, and, and CKD. And so, and then when they looked at the prevalence of the different types of hematologic malignancies, you can see that the acute leukemias um, and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma make up the majority of these patients. And then this, they've color-coded it to say that the patients who, who died are in red and the patients who have recovered are in blue. So the death rate in the acute leukemia patients is just over 30%, and the death rate in the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients is about 25%. And then when they looked at the malignancy status at the time of COVID-19 diagnosis, um, you can see that the rate of infection seemed to be similar across various disease status, meaning that the patients who were newly diagnosed or relapsed disease, though presumably undergoing more active chemotherapy, seemed to be affected at similar rates compared to those patients who were in remission or receiving treatment to maintain remission. And then when looking at uh, the most recent hematologic treatment purpose, you can see that most, the majority of the individuals were receiving intensive or um, therapy to induce remission 
and the infection, the recovery rate for those patients was about 60%. However, if we look at the patients who were receiving um, maintenance therapy or treatment just to, to maintain that remission, the recovery rate was much higher at 80%. So among the patients who were being treated, uh, there was a wide variety of different treatments being received, uh, from cytotoxic chemotherapy to targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and all in between. You would see the most common, or the, mo the majority of the patients were receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy, followed by targeted therapy, and then steroids or immunotherapy. The death rate, as you can see, is, was higher in those patients receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy. And then of note, I thought it was interesting that 10% of the patients um, who um, had received cellular therapy prior to their COVID-19 diagnosis, and in terms of different types of cellular therapy, this included both allotransplant, autotransplant, and a few CAR T-cell patients. When asked, when the physicians were asked about the patient's prognosis prior to their pre-COVID diagnosis, the majority of them answered that the patients had more than 12, 12 months to live. And then when asked about the symptoms of these patients, um, compared to, they seem to be similar to the general population. So the majority of these patients had fever, cough, shortness of breath, and fatigue. When looking at symptoms for the hematologic malignancy patients, the majority seemed to be uh, had symptoms that lasted for three to five days. However, you can also see that there were a higher number of patients who had short duration of symptoms at less than two days, if it spanned all the way to about 20 days. And then also when, when at, physicians were asked about treatment changes, what they would do with patients or how they would treat patients before their COVID diagnosis, it looks like the majority of, of treating providers were not uh, thinking about making any changes. However, after the COVID-19 diagnosis, about 25% 25 of patients had their treatment stopped temporarily. However, it seems that the plan was to resume treatment at a later date. In general, most of these patients, if they needed ICU admission, they were in favor of, of going to the ICU. However, there was um, a percentage of patients that it was recommended that they had a more palliative approach and the majority of these patients um, did die. So in general, when we look at, at COVID-19 outcomes across all the hemolignancy patients, you can see that about 60% of them recovered. And then when we look at the severity across these patients, about it seems equally a, about a third of patients required no hospitalization, a third of patients did require hospitalization, and a third of patients required ICU level care. When looking at laboratory values, I thought this was interesting that um, the majority of patients had a neutrophil count, an ANC, that was greater than 1,000, and a lymphocyte count that was low normal at 500 to 1,000. And then there was a different study that also looked at laboratory values um, and looked at mortality rates in, excuse me, in, in cancer patients just in general. And what they saw was that there was a relative anemia, increased white blood cell count, increased an increased ANC were associated with an increased mortality. They didn't allude as to why the increased ANC might have an increased rate in mortality, um, but they also noticed that there was an increase in the D-dimer um, LDH and lactate um, in those patients who, who had died from COVID-19. So just to summarize the ASH registry data, uh, the United States has contributed the most number of cases. 
In general, the infection rate seems to be more common uh, in aggressive hemolignancies, being acute leukemias and the, um, I'm assuming the diffuse large B cells of the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The infection rate is similar irrespective of cancer status. There's a higher death rate in patients receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, symptoms and duration seem to be similar compared to the general population, and a low ANC or ALC did not seem to increase the infection rate. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, some novel therapies, and so now this is, is switching gears a little bit in the sense that it's, um, I'm going to be presenting some data on on agents that we typically use for hematologic malignancy patients, but is being studied in the general population. So um, there's some data to suggest that abrutinib may protect against pulmonary injury in COVID-19 infected patients. So um, abrutinib is a brutin tyrosine kinase, or BTK inhibitor, which is used to treat indolent B-cell malignancies as well as chronic graft-versus-host disease and allogeneic transplant patients. In lung macrophages, BTK is a key regulator in the production of multiple cytokines and chemokines, including TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-10, and MCP-1. And treatment with abrutinib showed, that, showed decreased inflammatory cell infiltration and pro-inflammatory pro cytokines in lung tissues in the same in the same um, cytokines and chemokines, as well as some others, including CXCL1. And so this is really hypothesis, hypothesis generating that abrutinib and other BTK inhibitors may provide pulmonary protection against lung injury and even improve pulmonary function in hypoxic patients with COVID-19. And so I, I like this picture really because what it shows here is that um, if you have the, you have your SARS-CoV-2 virus, which binds to um, A2 on respiratory epithelial cells, which it then initiates infection and stimulates your alveolar macrophages to participate in the inflammatory response. And then here, below here, you can see this alveolar macrophage, and within that, you can see that there's a toll-like receptor, the SARS-CoV-2 virus binds to this toll-like receptor, which um, is connected to the BTK pathway, which initiates downstream signaling of NF-kappa-B, which then stimulates cytokine storm of the various cytokines here, which, which go on to stimulate neutrophil recruitment, as well as monocyte and macrophage recruitment, as well as CD4 T cell. And so this is, I know that this is a, um, a case series, but it was, um, it's a case series of six patients who have um, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia who were treated with abrutinib who developed a COVID-19 infection. So among these six patients, the median age was 66, and five of them were on the recommended treatment dose for Waldenstrom, which was 420 milligrams. And the sixth patient here on the last column here was on a reduced dose of 140 milligrams secondary to alphralgias. For all patients, the median time being on abrutinib was over four years. And their median time to COVID-19 related symptoms um, was five days. And so in general, um, all six patients experienced cough and fever as prodromal symptoms. And however, the five patients that were on the 420 milligrams of, of abrutinib did not experience any dyspnea and did not require hospitalization. And in general, their course was marked by steady improvement and near resolution of their COVID-19 symptoms during the follow-up period. What's interesting is that there's this, this um, patient six, which I recognize as only one patient, but um, he was on a reduced dose of the abrutinib again, and his chest CT showed bilateral ground glass opacities and a pleural effusion on admission, which prompted holding the abrutinib, after which his hypoxia acutely worsened and he required oxygenation, supplemental oxygenation. And then he was restarted on abrutinib at the low dose 140 and um, subsequently improved over the course of three days, as well as he, there was a decrease in their C, his C-reactive proteins. 
the patient unfortunately developed worsening hypoxic symptoms and was his dose of abrutinib was increased to 420 milligrams and he had a rapid improvement of oxygenation and he was um, and improved within day 12. Um, he had been intubated within that time but was able to be extubated. So again, one case, but maybe there's a hint at something there. In this case series, they also did a review, so trying to find a little bit more science behind the potential mechanism. So they looked at these three studies here on the left that all looked at patients uh, with SARS-CoV-1 or 2 infection and that these studies looked at the rates of inflammatory cytokines within um, ACE2 cells or plasma cells. And you can see here that there are various inflammatory markers that are elevated. And then there were four studies looking at patients who were on abrutinib either for CLL, Waldenstrom's, or GVHD. And they looked at plasma levels of different cytokines, and they saw a decrease in inflammatory cytokines in all of these patients. So then there was another study that, that um, was done um, in looking at acalabrutinib in severe COVID-19 affected patients. Again, this is the general population. There were 19 patients treated from March until April of this year. Um, they were confirmed COVID that required hospitalization and either displayed evidence of hypoxemia with a blood saturation of less than 94% with elevated inflammatory markers. It was broken down into two cohorts of those requiring supplemental oxygenation and those requiring invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, almost all the patients had inflammation with elevated CRP and ferritin levels. These patients were followed for a median duration of 12 days. And in the supplemental oxygen cohort, the acalabrutinib approved oxygenation in the majority of the patients, often with within three days without adding additional toxicity. Um, and in the invasive mechanical ventilation cohort, 50% of patients were extubated, with two being discharged from the hospital. Okay, so I know this is a busy slide, but all this to show is that they did, they did look at rates of oxygen efficiency um, in blue. They looked at absolute lymphocyte count in green, and they looked at C-reactive protein in red. And I think, in general, the message being presented here is that over time, the patients who were treated with the calibrutinib had an increase in their oxygen efficiency, um, a increase in their absolute lymphocyte count, and a decrease in their CRP over time. And so I, oh, well, we, I'm sure many people are aware that tocilizumab is, is being used in patients with, with, with um, COVID-19. And this was the only case report that I could find of a patient with a hematologic malignancy with multiple myeloma that was su successfully treated with tocilizumab. So this patient presented with chest tightness and shortness of breath and a um, a low O2 sat and was treated with methylprednisolone um, with minimal improvement but was subsequently given tocilizumab and had a decrease in their inflammatory markers um, and this was a span over a span of 19 days and on the bottom you can see um, the improvement in the ground glass opacities which are subtle um, Okay, so wrapping up here a little bit. So um, anti-CD20 therapy is very commonly used for many um, hematologic B cell malignancies as well as autoimmune diseases as well. And Ronald Levy here, who is one of the authors of this editorial, is one of the first um, investigators who, who developed brituximab, the anti-CD clonal um, antibody. And so in general, neutralizing antibodies play a dominant role in the protection against coronavirus, which is part of the humoral immune response, and that we know B cells are needed for development of the humoral immune response to antigens, and that these antibodies, rituximab, obinutuzumab, and ofatuumab, are used for B cell malignancies, but like I mentioned, also autoimmune disorders, 
And these antibodies are known to cause B cell depletion that can last anywhere from nine to 12 months. And we know it also impairs their response to vaccines. And so the editorial just brought up the fact of, um, in general, on for patients who are on these monoclonal antibodies, we typically suggest waiting six months after the end of treatment to give them these vaccines. And so in general, um, there was no right or wrong answer here, but should we be interrupting monoclonal antibody therapy for patients, maybe in particular older patients, um, if we think about the timeline of when a, um, a COVID-19 vaccine uh, might come along, it's you know, probably a, a year from now. And if patients are receiving active therapy, they're going to have depleted B cell stores for up to a year from now. Um, I'm not saying that we should necessarily change treatment, but I just think something to be mindful of in terms of the majority of patients who are older who are receiving these therapies may or may not have an adequate vaccine response. Um, so herd immunity will also be and play an important role in these patients. Okay, so um, in general, um, there so these recommendations have been taken from a compilation of our both our ASH and ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology guidelines consensus guidelines, as well as there was a review article um, based out of the group in Seattle that documented their experience and their recommendations. And so the first is to avoid inpatient treatment regimens when possible if it doesn't compromise potential for remission, to minimize exposure to healthcare facilities when possible, for older patients to consider novel therapy with single agents to minimize toxicity, um, for indolent lymphomas to consider deferring treatment as long as safely possible, um, since indolent lymphomas are not curable, uh, to use growth factors more liberally, both Neupogen and Neulasta, as long as it doesn't compromise the patient, and also to recognize that every patient is, treat is different and treatment should be based on the needs of the individual and the rates of the COVID-19 infection based on the particular city um, that that patient is in. So in summary, uh, the incidence, prevalence, mortality, and severity of complications are all higher in cancer patients, especially those in hematologic malignancies. About 25% of patients have an interruption in treatment, but 60% of patients recover from the COVID-19 infection. There is no consensus on laboratory findings that may aid in treatment, at least for hematologic malignancy patients up until this point. Abrutinib or other BTK inhibitors may help with an inflammatory response. And previous immunotherapy may hinder potential for antibody re response to the vaccine. And there's still a lot we don't know. So I just wanted to mention two studies that I'm uh, actively involved in. One is um, the COVID antibody study, which many of you have participated in. So we thank you for that. This is a study that I'm working on with Dr. Atkins, where we're looking at serologic conversion rates um, and of, of antibodies. Um, we have some preliminary results so far, and we looked at just under um, a thousand hospital patients and a little over 400 cancer patients, and in general across the whole cohort, there are less than 2% of all patients, both cancer patients and staff, exhibited antibodies, so pretty low rate. Half of the subjects with antibodies um, were known to have a COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, and the majority of the seropositive patients had few symptoms um, and qualified as being asymptomatic. And there were no risk factors that were significantly associated with the virus exposure and anti antibody development, at least based on the questions that we've answered so far. So we're still analyzing the data, and there's more to come. So we'll keep you posted from that standpoint. And then the second one is a retrospective study that I've been working on with Dr. Cobb and um, some of the folks from the Department of Medicine, as well as some fellows and residents. And so what we're doing is looking at all um, looking at across all the MedStar hospitals, all the patients who have been infected with, with COVID and um, comparing the patients with hematologic malignancies compared to the general population and looking at various 
various um, parameters in terms of clinical outcomes. Um, and so we're hoping to present some preliminary data to, to ASH, which is in the fall. And so with that, I'll leave you with this quote from John F. Kennedy, which is, the greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. And again, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Katie, for a great talk. Um, and just to remind the audience that if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, we have one from Dr. Fisher who said, do you think it is unlikely since patients with malignancies seem to have a severe course that they would be asymptomatic carriers? Um, so that's a good question. I think that, um, I think the question is getting at that there, it says that they would be unlikely to be asymptomatic carriers. I, I think there's two cohorts of patients. I think there's the patients that have um, lower immune systems and so are therefore maybe are unable to mount a response, so then more likely to be asymptomatic carriers. And then there are the other patients who um, are just going to have more severe complications because they're either on chemotherapy um, or are immunosuppressed. I think we really don't know, especially in the hematologic malignancy patients, because they just make up a smaller percentage compared to the solid tumor patients. Um, but in general, in cancer patients, I think that um, we still just need to, to better understand what's going on. That's one of the things I do want to look at in the retrospective study is to be able to look at if we can gather from the data the rates of symptoms and the duration of symptoms. Um, when we're looking at, when we looked at the, the antibody study, um, it didn't seem to be that there were a higher percentage of patients who were asymptomatic who tested positive, although, again, it, it was a really small number of patients who had antibodies in general. Thank you. And can you also comment um, in your decision tree after patients actually have had COVID, um, how you and your colleagues are approaching when to restart therapy, and are you, are you altering that based upon whether or not it's chemotherapy or immunotherapy? Yeah, that's a good question. We were, um, when COVID was, was more prevalent, we were having weekly, um, weekly COVID meetings amongst, um, amongst Lombardi, which, which, um, John can, can attest to. And so I think we tried, we were trying to come up with consensus, but the thing was is that the rates and things were changing so frequently that it was hard to, once we got a consensus, something would change and we, it, we couldn't apply the same, the same ideas as we had even just the week before. So I think you just really have to tail it to the individual patient. I think for our hospital in particular, we don't have a separate outpatient COVID area where we could treat patients safely. And so I think what we're doing, or I know what I'm doing, is that I am delaying patients um, until, um, and with the guidance of infectious disease in terms of duration of symptoms and number of days, um, for them to postpone their treatment until are kind of out of a quarantine period, both for their safety as well as um, to prevent spread of, of bringing those patients into the clinic or into the hospital. Um, luckily, um, I've only had one patient who, who has been COVID positive, and she is an acute leukemia patient, an, an AML patient, um, but her symptoms were very mild, so I think she got lucky. Um, I do also remember at before I started her treatment, there were two treatment options, and I did choose the option that was less likely to cause um, her her neutrophil count to go low, and so that might have contributed to why her symptoms were less. But I think it's really just we'll just have to um, each of us have to decide what's best for the patient at that time and what their short-term and long-term treatment plan is. Great. Uh, from Dr. Phillips, any evidence that immune-boosting ther uh, immunotherapy can be protective in terms of preventing COVID? That's a good question. I haven't seen any re recently. That's not to say that it's not necessarily out there. Um, I think what we don't know is that um, we don't know whether or not the severity of symptoms correlate with the, um, the level of antibody detection. So I think so in general, a lot of the commercially available COVID antibody tests that are being done are just positive negative. 
they're not giving you um, they're not giving you a breakdown of if it's IgG versus IgM, and they're also not giving you a titer level. So I think there's more data to be done in terms of being able to look at the titer level and then correlate that with symptoms um, to see what titer level we need that actually will mount a sufficient response to protect patients against um, events COVID-19. Um, I've been I've been reading in the news lately too that there are patients who are, are people reporting that who have gotten COVID-19 one time and so then they thought they were protected and now they're giving it a second time. So I think there's still a lot that we don't know about the level of antibody titers relative to immune response. Okay. I know that doesn't answer your question at the tangent, but, so but many, um, more, more information. Thank you. And then from Dr. Belanti, is there a place for administration of interferon? Yeah, I haven't seen, that's a good question too. Um, at least what's been published, I haven't seen anything about use of interferons for that. Um, it's what's out there so far has really just been focused, at least in the heme malignancy space, on the BTK inhibitors um, as opposed to dampening down that inflammatory response. But I think it's interesting. I mean, I think there are multiple ways to to interfere with the inflammatory pathway. Um, it's just a matter of balancing that with the, you know, with the immune system. And uh, one point I did want to make, too, about the difference between abrutinib and acalabrutinib um, was is that acalabrutinib is known to have fewer bleeding complication risks compared to abrutinib, as well as fewer cardiac arrhythmias. And so when they specifically looked at the study and they noticed no increased rates of toxicity, they were specifically commenting on bleeding rates and, and cardiac toxicity. So if there's, you know, more data to come, and I know that the that AstraZeneca is doing a larger acalabrutinib study, so if more data comes, I think that there will probably be less toxicity with acalabrutinib over compared to abrutinib. Great. I'll ask if there are any questions. Otherwise, we'll end early today, and thank you again for a great talk. Um, everybody have a great day. Yeah, Bye. thank you.